No day, I wanted to talk to you about selecting a cooler for a glycol ground coupled heat exchanger, how to set up this system so that it works properly. I will explain the simplest way to set up this system. See, we have tubes buried. These are 32 diameter tubes buried at a depth of 1 meter, 82 meters. And this is very important. We installed the tubes in a humid environment. The more humid, the better they transfer heat. We have a simple scheme. Pump solenoid valve and a regular service valve for glycol distribution. The second valve is a safety valve and an expansion vessel. This is our entire system, very simple. To be honest with you, with these pressures, even if this is not installed, it should still function. But for safety reasons, we always have to install the safety valve and our expansion vessel. Literally not the same, so there's nothing more. On chair handling unit, we have the intakes, the air goes through the intake, through our glycol cooler. It reaches the air handling unit in the summer. It is cooled here. In the winter, uh, it is heated. Uh, I will show you the temperature profile uh, for winter. Uh, the average one we created for uh, typical Polish conditions. Uh, it depends on the temperature. Uh, the costs of such a system range uh, between two and a half, uh, three, four thousand. And this system will pay for itself. But remember that with the glycol exchanger power, let's say at 200 meters of those tubes. Depends on the environment, but on average we achieve two, two and a half kilowatts. With a regular air system where air flows through these tubes, uh, we get one kilowatt more. Mm. Its main advantage is that uh, there is no condensation of water, no odors, no mold, because we have a separate system here. Air passes through our cooler, which we can clean, wash at any point. Uh, I suspect anyone can, uh, uh, can set up such a system like the one in this drawing. You don't need experts. You might even have issues finding uh, a glycol exchanger expert, Nabam, but it's so simple. Last time I channel my sink, is that any plumber, any electrician can do it. Uh, you just need to dig a two meter hole and lay out these hoses. I've given an example. There are several ways to lay out these hoses. You can find them on the internet. Uh, connecting this can also be done by any plumber. There is no problem at all. As I said, it's a cheap system that will definitely pay for itself. But uh, we must install it in a place where there is high ground moisture, uh, where there is water. If you installed something like this in a river at a depth of 2 meters, you would have air conditioning with a power of, say, even 10 kilowatts. You have winter heating with a power of, say, 2 or 3 kilowatts. The first heat pumps in Poland were created in the 1980s. These were um, heat pumps developed in uh, Poniatowa, where there was a compressor manufacturer. Old refrigerators manufactured in Poland had uh, compressors from this company in Poniatowa. That's where the first pumps prototypes were being developed. I saw some documentation there. They were developed in such a way that uh, this exchanger was installed in a septic tank. Yeah? and they were done in hotels. The septic tank never proved, so it was a source of heat. And uh, it was fantastic. But back then, uh, coal was cheap during the communist era, and these projects got buried. It's like in the automotive industry, where various projects get buried. In the 1970s or late 1970s, in Poniatowa, the heat pump project was also buried, but it was an exceptional project. The source was not in the ground, but rather in a lake, septic tank or something like that. It was a specially developed exchanger. The efficiency was very, very high. Paul thought, and, uh, thought about this a long time ago and had been creating such systems for a long time. And I don't know if anyone in Poland has such a system now. 
although I saw two or three systems like this with the heat pumping a pond at a suitably large depth, but I haven't seen a septic tank or sewage systems. But that can be used. It can also be used in large sewage treatment plants. There's always higher temperatures, chemicals. Uh, yeah, a lot can be done. I'm shocked that um, no engineer has taken this on. I haven't seen such a solution or maybe I'm looking for it the wrong way. Now I'll explain uh, how to select uh, the parameters for a cooler, how to calculate those temperatures. Uh, Delta T yeah. when selecting coolers. Now I wanted to discuss the chart, uh, uh, the characteristics of the ground. No? At a depth of 2 meters we have temperatures for January, February, March, April, May, June, July and so on. On this axis we have temperature. I did a range here. What is this all about? If we were to measure in Poland, let's say, at a distance of 100 meters in one year, if there are any ground waters, these temperatures will vary. Uh, that's why you have such a wide range here. I did this based on about 50 different measurements in various places and based on experience. Uh, also, we, we once made a temperature recorder and we also tested it, but at a depth of one meter 60. And that's roughly how it looks. Just one more very important thing. This is a general characteristic. We can't look at it as a perfect thing because each year has a different summer, a different winter, a different spring a different temperature distribution. So these curves can shift, they can be a little bit higher, they little lower, but I think we managed to make it so that this is correct. And let's take for example January. December is not so cold yet, the snow hasn't melted. Uh, so let's say in January we have a temperature in the ground ranging from 2 to 5 degrees. In July or in August, let's say in July, we have from 8 to uh, uh, 16 degrees. Now, we are talking about the soil temperature at a depth of 2 meters. This is an average distribution in Poland. I repeat, an average. It uh, can be different in different places and it depends on the years. But let's say this is the tolerance. Now, let's have a look at an example. In July, we have a temperature of, on average, let's say 10 degrees. Let's mark this point of 10 degrees. So, we have the temperature of the ground. Let's mark it TZ. So, uh, we have the TZ temperature determined for July, but there's one more important thing. If we have a glycol or any other exchanger connected, if it's in an exceptionally wet source, meaning the tubes are placed in wet soil, then this temperature will hold for, for a very long time. Uh, but, but if we install it in a dry location, in a moist or even exceptionally dry ground, if the heat exchanger works, it brings heat to the ground and we move from a temperature of 10 degrees here to say 12, uh, 13, 14, then this source needs to rest again for two, three, four hours. The soil must give back this heat and then we start our glycol ground coupled heat exchanger or any exchanger again. Uh, that's how it works. Yeah, there are always uh, uh, fluctuations in temperature and in the summer, um, if we bring warm water there, the temperature increases. As I said, it can oscillate even up to that point uh, to around 15, 16 degrees. And then the glycol exchanger has to be turned off for an hour or two. Very often in ventilation systems, this is done by letting the source rest, for example, at a night when it's cool in the summer. For instance, in the summer it's 22 or 23 degrees. We then let our entire exchanger rest and we activate the bypass and draw in cool air from the outside. In the summer, we also cool rooms this way. 
Now, it's very important to know how to calculate the power of a cooler. It's very simple, anyone can do it. Look, the temperature of the ground, I assume that it's 10 degrees. At test us. It's 10 degrees Celsius. The temperature in the summer, we assume, say, 32 degrees. TP air temperature and it's 32 degrees Celsius. The external temperature, this is TP air temperature and it equals 32 degrees Celsius. And now, if we have something like this, we calculate delta T. It's the difference between these two temperatures. And this equals 22 degrees Celsius. Uh, we have a 22 degrees Celsius. So now look. Uh, we go to our chart. This is heater power as a function of the average temperature difference. This is the power of this device and it's 22 degrees. There you go. We have 22 degrees here. We are moving and here you have power somewhere around 3 kilowatts. I'll uh, be honest with you, it is completely sufficient. Although it is given at a flow rate of 600 cubic meters, but for a flow rate of 400, you have a level of say two and a half kilowatts. There's not much of a difference. So look, selecting a cooler, which costs about a thousand zloty, and these tubes, ducts, all this equipment. We have cooling power here, and you could say heating power at the level of two and a half, three kilowatts. This is the maximum you can use from this source. Uh, remember that all our coolers, or even when you buy another one, they must have a water drain and be insulated. Uh, look at the size of this device. Here we have 200 millimeters and here we have the whole thing. So you could say that these devices should be 60 centimeters by about 50, 60 centimeters. Uh, it's about the size. This cooler has to be large and it is because it needs to allow a gentle flow and it also can't create too much resistance. Having explained how to read the power of the cooler, how to select it, how to calculate the delta T, I believe you can handle it. All of you will be able to choose a cooler, do the calculation and install a glycol exchanger. It's not rocket science. It's all quite simple. Thank you very much.